Hello, I'm Greg Sanders, Group Publisher at FSR Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Better Your Breakfast with the Breakfast Queen. So the Breakfast Queen in question is acclaimed restaurateur Ina Pinckney, and today you'll learn how she became known as the Breakfast Queen and how coffee played a vital role in her success. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. First, this session is being recorded, and we will let you know when the recording is available. Second, we'll be taking your questions at the end of the program, and you can use the functionality on the webinar console to submit a question at any time. All right, and now to begin, I'd like to welcome Jill Kinslow, Marketing Manager at Segafredo Zanetti, to the program. Jill? Thank you, Greg. At Segafredo Zanetti, we pride ourselves on being more than just a great cup of coffee. Our relationship with you, the operator, begins with a consultative uh, advice suited to your operation and continues with ongoing support to drive your business forward. Segafredo has been in the cafe business for 30 years. Uh, we opened our first cafe in Paris in 1988. And we now have over 350 cafes across the globe in locations like Tokyo, Berlin, and Milan, as well as here in the U.S. and Miami. In addition to the cafes, we are also served in more than 100,000 food service locations around the world. Uh, and, you know, clearly our approach to coffee is globally informed, but we also understand the U.S. market and tailor our products and programs to the taste of American consumers. At Segafredo Zanetti, we offer everything you need to create a full premium coffee offering in your operation. We know what coffee means or has the potential to mean to your business, so we continue to support our partnership with ongoing beverage training, menu analysis and recommendations, and promotion ideas to help you, the operator, drive traffic into your location and grow your check averages. Essentially, we help you bring your coffee program to life. This webinar is an example of the added value we love to bring to our customers. Ina will no doubt speak from her own experience about working with a trusted coffee partner and how that partnership helped solidify her as the breakfast queen. Enjoy, and don't hesitate to reach out with questions during the webinar uh, or after. And without further ado, Ina Pickney. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Greg. It's very um, moving for me to be sitting here and to be talking to operators because I know your world, I know your day, I know your struggles. And I wanted to tell you how I started in this business and what it means to me to, uh, to be sitting here today. So here I am, that's me. And I want you to see um, that I have a, a real presence in the food world, especially here in Chicago. So I wrote a memoir cookbook um, called Ina's Kitchen. And as you can see, I have light as air pancakes. The next, I want you to see that there's a documentary about the closing of my restaurant, which I did voluntarily and with great heart. And you'll see that on um, Amazon Prime right now, Breakfast at Ina's. And if you want to see how I did, what I did, it's a great 50 minutes. Uh, just make some popcorn. And then I have a column in the Chicago Tribune, a monthly column that's called Breakfast with Ina. And the reason I want to be sure the word breakfast stays in there is because I'm not a brunch girl. Brunch is just not my beat. And so I go out to breakfast restaurants, and I just write about them um, in terms of having a conversation with my readers and with my old customers. So I'm interested in filling up your seats Monday to Friday, which is where you need the money and the, and the connection with your customers. And so that's my monthly column. And this was, looks like the last column of the month, breakfast dishes that I loved in 2019 that I really wish I could eat again. So that's how, I, that's how I'm known right now as the breakfast queen. And because breakfast has now reemerged and it's being reinvented in the last few years, I'm happy to say, it's really time to talk about what we can do to help you jump on that breakfast bandwagon and find new customers and an unexpected and much needed revenue stream. So I set the standard in 1991, and boy, that seems like a long time ago right now. And if you'll notice that I have these really light as air, heavenly hot pancakes, sour cream pancakes that really melt in your mouth. And we started with very unusual coffee because I couldn't find anything that I really wanted that met, measured up to the level of my food. And so I'm going to talk about that in a little bit because that was key in my success. You'll also know that in almost every one of the pictures of my um, food, you're going to see a coffee mug or a coffee cup or something because I keep trying to impress 
with the fact that we have coffee that we're really proud of. So I'm going to start telling you about what breakfast was in the old days. And by the way, in the 80s, I had a bakery and went out to breakfast every day. And was the coffee worth drinking? That gets a resounding no. You would sit there and you would have your breakfast. And then you'd think, oh, my God, this coffee is so bad. It's just so bad. And, and you make it sort of like you can drink it with enough sugar and enough cream. And then the server comes over with a pot that, you know, has been sitting on the burner for so long. And she said, honey, do you want to warm up? And if you say yes, it ruins the coffee for the rest of the meal. And if you say no, you never see her again in this life. So I sat around thinking about these coffee trends. And I thought about the food trends that I was seeing. And I, every day at my bakery, I would sort of think about what was this going to look like? What was my restaurant going to look like? And so I looked and there were lots of new um, food items, um, traditional ingredients that people wanted, but I had to be able to get them locally. And remember, at every breakfast joint, it was two eggs over easy, bacon, whole wheat toast, and, and that's what people just ordered. I had to prove to them that I could make that same dish, but with pasteurized free-range eggs, garlic roasted red potatoes, applewood smoked bacon, artisan seeded bread, soft sweet butter, and served with premium coffee. The experience would be exciting and it would be palate opening. Now I also had to think about the environment and I wanted my food to be served in a nurturing environment which meant white tablecloths, heavy flatware, carpeting, acoustical tiles, and no loud music. And in 1991, this was really revolutionary. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. So it went right between the hotel dining room and the diners. So everywhere you looked, it was quiet, it was peaceful. You can see the carpeting, you can see the glassware. Um, it was really a very beautiful, quiet, lovely place to, to go. So then I kept thinking about, all right, now I have to really work on the food. And the food had to be different than anything else. So this was a vegetable hash that we served with cumin and garlic and Tabasco. And it had Brussels sprouts in it. And nobody would eat them in those days. It was so funny to get the plates back and the Brussels sprouts were pushed to the side. Um, but that didn't stop me. Didn't stop me at all. And then I did a dish that was called scrapple. So those of you out uh, in the Middle East, Middle Atlantic, um, you will see this looks kind of familiar. In the olden days, they would take scraps from the slaughter on the farm and they would mix it with cornmeal and spices, and then they would loaf it and then they would put it in the root cellar. And on a farm, after a particularly long winter, there are no uh, protein sources except people had this piece of scrapple that they'd cut and saute. Now, I love the idea that it was a life-saving dish, but I hated the dish, and I hated the color, and I hated the smell. But I thought, why can't I take all of those nice spices and mix in cheddar cheese and black beans and corn and do the same thing, loaf it, chill it, cut off a slice and saute it. And so there we had the scrapple, and then we did fresh chorizo and scrambled eggs. And you'll notice in the photograph a glass mug. We served all of our espresso drinks in glass mugs so that people could see the magic of the layers of the milk on the bottom, the espresso kind of in the middle, and all of that glorious foam on top. That was a very definite piece of our branding that we wanted to explain. We did pancakes. You saw the ones before the Heavenly Hots that was so, so delicate. And then we did gingerbread pancakes at a time when nobody was doing anything seasonal with spices. There was no pumpkin spice latte in 1991, but I did these gingerbread pancakes and served it with a lemon cream, and people absolutely loved it. Then I did um, an authentic version of, an, of a huevos rancheros. I did my own black beans with some garlic. I did the cheese correctly. I made my own salsa. And I remember we're going back a lot of years. And this was absolutely unheard of at that time. So I was very proud of myself, very proud, still am. We also made our own granola. Nobody was doing that. You know, you can go to the grocery store, not even see granola on the shelves. 
in those days. And then we were known for our fried chicken and waffles. We were the only restaurant in town doing that, except for some fast food place that was somewhere um, out in the burbs. And people just loved it. And one of the reasons that I did it was because we were serving fried chicken for dinner. And after the recession, we just cut out dinner. And we needed to replace this dish because people were asking for our fried chicken. So it was a bone in, back out. We made our own waffles. You saw some uh, spicy honey. We decided that would be the right thing to do. And then um, we always made sure that we showed the picture with a Bloody Mary and coffee. Do you notice? Yeah, you do. So every ingredient, you know, that I had to find had to be available through my local store, my distributor. And back in 1990, the biggest problem I had was that there were no roasters and no coffee that was really good. Um, There were institutional packs, and most restaurants were pushing to 70 cups a pound and leaving it on the burner all day. That would never, ever, ever do for my concept. Never. There I was having to figure out how was I going to get really good coffee into my restaurant with my flavorful food. Remember, we're going back all the way to 1991. So here we are, seven years before Google, and I have to find coffee. I had to use my connections. I used trade magazines. I used intuition, and I asked people, where is coffee being served, where I would be proud to have their coffee? And it took my search over to Seattle, where I had heard and read that that city took coffee seriously. And I found a small roaster and used their excellent product until Chicago finally birthed a few roasters. And boy, was I happy. So all the roasters were doing a good job and and sometimes a great job with the coffee. But what was missing for me as a new operator was a partnership, someone at the other end of the call when I had a question or a problem. That didn't exist. I didn't feel supported in any way. Now, granted, back in 1995, that that was the dark ages of coffee roasting, brewing, and consumption. The roasters were finding their way and growing their businesses just like I was. And it was a challenge. It was a challenge. I got an espresso machine. I went to their lab and tasted coffee. And I settled on one of their blends that was complex enough to match the flavors of my food. I thought about my coffee choice the way I thought about wine pairing with my food. And that made all the difference. It couldn't be a mild, namby-pamby kind of a blend for my food. It had to have body. It had to have interest. It had to take me someplace that when I took a sip of that, it matched the level of the food. So then I asked them about optimal brewing, and they said they would research machines and they would supply them to me. From that minute on, we were partners in my success, more so than any other vendor perhaps, because coffee was going to be served all day. From that minute on, we were the partners and that's all it took. They listened, they heard my question or problem, they offered to educate me and fix the issue, and they took one more worry off my plate. I said to them that day that they had now set the expectation, and while they could count on me as a customer, I would forever count on them to support me. And that handshake sustained both of us for 18 years that I was open. While I had so much trouble finding that partner, you get to order Segafredo Zanetti from a Cisco. Then a Segafredi rep walks through your door, promising and then proving that they will be your trusted brand and trusted partner. They become part of what makes you nimble and creative. Every operator should be happy to have them on your team. And what a relief for me it was, and it will be for you too, to have a sales rep give me advance information that cold brew or nitro were the next big things, and then teach me how to incorporate the new items into my program. By the way, with all my research, all espresso-based drinks are growing at a very fast pace. Pitching, 
Cold brew is gaining, and this summer it'll be bigger than when it was introduced. Nitro is still holding, but not growing as quickly. The other thing that I did that nobody else was doing is I started writing a newsletter to my customers. In those days, it was easy to gather home addresses, so I mailed them out, I printed it and mailed them out. And um, then it went digital when I had over 2,000 on my list. But the reason I love the newsletter is because it allowed me to educate my customers. So there I was writing information about what was coming up at the restaurant, about any parties that they might want to book. I was giving little trivia facts. And then I had one whole section where I talked about a particular product. And I talked about the coffee and why we did what we did, why we used what we used, what was available, how we would make espressos and lattes and cappuccinos. And all of these things were right there in the newsletter. And people read them. We put them in the check presenters. We mailed them to their homes. And so they were educated. And one of the sweetest things when I walked through the dining room was to hear somebody at a table telling a friend who they brought with them that, oh, yeah, she uses this coffee. It's really good. And why I did what I did. It really, it, it, was, it was perfect. So there's the introduction, you know, to how I started and what I think was really part of my success. Then there are two days in the history of breakfast when the world changed. Number one, in 1972, the Egg McMuffin heralded the beginning of a fast food breakfast market, and morning rush time was a brilliant natural fit for that fast food. And then October 16, 2015, McDonald's announced to the world, you can have breakfast all day in your time on your terms. The Technomic 2019 survey shows that 52% of the people enjoy eating breakfast foods at non-traditional times of the day, and 31% were purchasing breakfast outside of morning hours more often. The best number, 51%, said they purchased coffee with any away-from-home purchase. There was a new category that was added that was called pre-breakfast. And pre-breakfast was a high-energy start, uh, smoothie pouches, maybe jerkies, protein bars, yogurt cups. Then there was a delayed breakfast. Breakfast for lunch is seen as a little indulgent, while breakfast for dinner is pure comfort food. And that day part, that day part was a megatrend, and still be, the day part blur will be a megatrend. Breakfast anytime. So what's brewing in coffee today? Oh, my dears, there is so much. There is so much. I don't know anybody that sits down at a table and doesn't think about coffee with what they're eating um, for breakfast. So pay attention. $18 billion coffee industry is booming, and there's no end in sight. Those are some pretty big numbers. And the five most common breakfast beverages, coffee leads the pack. Um, most Americans, 54% drink coffee every day, more women than men. And then 50% drink espresso, cappuccino, latte, or iced coffee. Cold brew, as I said, continues to grow. 70% of consumers say that a disappointing coffee negatively impacts their opinion of the restaurant. That's a very interesting number. And you can probably attest to that. If you've gone out and had a meal and the coffee was bad, you know that it just something is just not right. And so let's take a look here at what's going on in that breakfast day part. First of all, breakfast is definitely not brunch. Um, we have people, and I'm sure you've seen it, they get, they're working from home, they come to your restaurant, they set up their computer, they sit, they have breakfast, um, and then they go back and finish their day's work at home. They get going at your place. So how to fill those seats during the week? Well, the home is one competition place. Most people don't make breakfast at home. There's more and more oatmeal being made because you can use a slow cooker and cook it overnight. Fast food drive throughs they will exist forever. The question is, are they good? The answer is no. And then there's coffee shops. And what they have is, you know, yesterday's muffins and scones that they brought in from another bakery, uh, from a bakery, and, and people are sitting there and having their, their coffee with that. You have the opportunity to change all of that. 
Um, by the way, breakfast will be the major battlefront this year. Wendy's launched breakfast yesterday, March 2nd, and the reviews from the Washington Post, the takeout, and even some lesser known blogs that I read last night say that the Egg McMuffin will rest in mediocrity peace. What do you think that means? You think that, that Wendy's has upped its game? I'm gonna tell you how much it's upped its game. They are also promoting their new coffee blend. That tells you a lot. Here, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the breakfast sandwiches that I've seen around. There are a lot of them. Um, even the Wendy's is putting it on a croissant bun so that there's none of this little pointy uh, shattering dough on the table. So there's brioche buns, potato buns. People are making sandwiches with freshly made eggs and lots of bacon or fried pancetta. I've seen lots of that. I mean, everything is a, ta is, is a variation on a theme of egg, bacon, and cheese. How many ways can you do that? A lot of flavor uh, additions, a chipotle mayo or chipotle butter. Please, people are doing all kinds of things to get you to taste that sandwich in a brand new way. This one I found so interesting. Um, this is a variation, the one on the left. It's a bruschetta, a breakfast bruschetta. And instead of an avocado toast, they take uh, corn and they mash up corn and then they put a salsa on top of it and then cilantro. And you notice they don't, they call it an elote, an elote toast instead of corn toast because elote sounds so much better. And then biscuits. Biscuits will always be, always be on menus, always. Um, can you make your own? It's pretty labor intensive. Um, can you buy a really good frozen one? The answer is yes, as long as you know how to bake them off and be patient with them. So the bruschetta and the biscuits. You want to add some new breakfast ideas? This couldn't be easier. Just put out platters that you don't have to really cook anything. So you have bagels and lox and cream cheese and a hard boiled egg and chopped and uh, capers and chopped red onions, um, and that's really a, a lovely thing. But look at the one on the right. That was at a Kurdish restaurant that I went to. And so the only thing that was really cooked over there, there's an egg dish with some uh, different kinds of sausage in it, and then there's up on the top, right on the top in the square plate, there was a phyllo dough that was wrapped um, around some uh, sausage also, and that was just baked off. Not a lot of cooking going on. There's one on the bottom too. Um, and so there's so many ways of entering this field where you don't have to do a day's worth of, of prep. The other thing is a breakfast bowl. Now, at the beginning, I wasn't sure if bowls were going to be a fad or a trend. And now, obviously, they are a trend because Applebee's just started promoting their irresistible. The one thing about bowls that is so interesting is that you can blend familiar and authentic. This is one I created for the American Egg Board. So it has um, on the bottom uh, collard greens. It has chicken sausage. Um, it has red potatoes. And then instead of making uh, a French vinaigrette kind of sauce called the grabiche, um, which shreds the hard boiled eggs, I chunked them up so that you could see them on top and then put the vinaigrette over it. So this is good. Psychologists say that millennials like bowls because it reminds them of their childhood when they would eat out of a bowl. I have no doubt about that. But there's so many ways of making it satiating and, um, and with grains, with greens, with some raw fish on it as a poke or some pulled chicken. Um, bowls are easy to do, easy to do. Here, breakfast and coffee go hand in hand. So this is how to make a successful innovation. There are changing tastes now. Flavor density and heat are important. My theory is because all the young chefs grew up eating Cheetos and Doritos, and they're used to a flavor density that many of us are not used to. So you're going to find more intense flavoring. And these are trained high-end chefs that are bringing their knowledge about ingredients and techniques to breakfast. That is really fabulous for all of us. And number this, coffee matters. Coffee matters big time. Um, it's 
more than ever, I think, more than ever. There's so much competition for that that if you don't rise up and brand and partner with your coffee, um, you're losing out on an opportunity. So what do we want to do? We want to take true and traditional, and we want to make it new and now. We want to talk about global influences in breakfast, the infusion of spices. Cardamom is going to be very big this year with turmeric, and we want to make it authentic. And when I say authentic, it's the difference between Taco Bell and a taco truck. That's the difference, and that's the authenticity that we need. And then we have grab and go. It's healthy and it's portable and it's authentic. Um, and think about this, these herb frittatas that are being sold on streets in London with Asian rice bowls and tuna and chicken. Now in Chicago, lucky us, we have this new place that's doing scallion pancakes. Um, look at that. Put it in a bag to go with coffee. Delish. So this, they're hot here in Chicago. They are super hot. So remember, we have the flavor density. So remember the old days when putting a bottle of hot sauce on a table meant exotic? Well, now the customer gets to decide how much heat. Look up Vulcan Fire Salt. It was from one of the spice houses, and I kept all of that on the table. Everybody got it so that they could shake out as much heat as they wanted on their entire dish as opposed to just putting drop, drop, drop. Um, porridge and oatmeal are big. A restaurant opened in Brooklyn in the last couple of weeks that has a bottomless porridge station. Rice porridge with sweet and savory toppings. I thought that was really kind of genius. So you, they buy, they pay for the bowl. They can keep going back to the porridge station, um, and you keep that in a, uh, a slow cooker. It could not be easier. And then I want to talk about oatmeal because oatmeal is still huge. I know I have it lumped under porridge and oatmeal, but it stands by itself. He did a great story on Bob's Red Mill not too long ago on TV, and he eats oatmeal every day. And it's delicious, steel-cut oatmeal. Don't use the flat ones if you don't have to. Get the steel-cut oatmeal. And I want you to know that espresso is now being used to cook oatmeal. So look up the recipes online. They're extraordinary. I would eat that almost every day. I'm getting my nutrition and a nice jolt. I love that. So traditional dishes. Think about how you can take what you know and change it around a little bit. Are you in the South? Make your eggs Benedict regional. Use grits as a carrier. Add a fried green tomato slice, a little bit of grilled pork belly, a poached egg, and some Cajun aioli. You have the opportunity to do that with whatever region you are in to turn a Benedict into something else. And then pancakes. Always think about the halo of health that people want. They feel indulgent having pancakes, but if you put in some farro flour and add seeds to some nutritional value, all of a sudden, you've changed the perspective. You've changed what it means to have pancakes for breakfast. The other thing I want to talk about is sweeteners, because over the last few years, maple syrup gained new followers, and it isn't going anywhere. And now with spirit infusions, bourbon, rum, even hot peppers, it offers some new layers of flavor. And you can serve the best you can afford and put it in a little pitcher. Um, don't go the cheap route. People use much less when it's really the good stuff. So here, what I see and what I know for sure, I eat out a lot. I eat out a lot of breakfast. Today I ate out and had some shrimp and grits, and I had a biscuit and gravy, and then I had a grits bowl, and then I had fried chicken and sweet potato waffle. Now, yes, I had people with me, but I tasted it all because I want to know what's going on out there, and I want to know What's, what you should know, and, and what I see and what I know for sure is what I want to share with you. So what makes successful innovation on a breakfast menu? It has to be familiar, like a breakfast sandwich, and one of a kind, so maybe with global flavors. You have to order, a, excuse me, you have to offer a very high quality wow coffee experience at the table or at the counter, and it has to give a sensory reaction. You know when you've had really good coffee or the perfect latte, your shoulders drop. You just feel the feeling, and boy, is that ever the best. So hold on. I lost my place here because I'm so thinking about that latte that I'm going to have when I finish this today. 
Um, I want to talk about how we're going to increase our uh, check averages. That is a really important part of what we did in my restaurant. I couldn't figure out why they got stuck, why they got stagnant. And then I watched very, very carefully of um, how my everything happened at that table. So I watched the hostess seat the people. I then watched the people get settled and uh, look around with their look around the table where they were, and then sort of pick up the menu. And that was the moment that the server arrived at that table and said, coffee? And of course, people said, sure, and they had coffee. And there was the pain point for me, because once people have coffee, they don't have juice. How was I going to get them to know that I had freshly squeezed orange juice and that I wanted them to try it? So we hired a young man who was a juice man, and he would show up in the morning and get his station ready with what he needed um, to be able to sell uh, juices. Now, if I walk up to you and if I say to you, um, would you like um, uh, orange juice? You in a nanosecond would think, is that freshly squeezed? Is it cold? I wonder how big it is. I wonder how much it costs. But if I walk up to you with a tray, and on that tray is orange juice, freshly squeezed orange juice, and grapefruit juice, and maybe a, a Virgin Mary, you see it, you want it. So I thought, okay, now there's a beginning. I would see this table already change their ordering pattern because the juice man got there before the server. So the juice man puts down juice for you, juice for you, juice for you. And by the time the server got there, they were already booked for three juices. Then I thought, why can't I do this with my espresso drinks or my iced coffee? And the answer was I could. So we started adding things to that tray. And there was this beautiful iced coffee, and it had big ice cubes in it. And then we would take whipping cream, and we'd whip it up just a little bit and put it on top of the ice so that it would undulate down the whole big glass and people would look at it and be absolutely transfixed by it and we would sell more iced coffees in the summer than iced tea and that was really good. And then in the winter time uh, and in the fall mostly, we would do the espresso drinks and you saw the mug that I used. I wanted to be sure people could see it. You see it, you want it. You don't think about it. You just want it. So all of a sudden, my check averages are up $5, $6, $7. And then once the staff understands that their tips are involved, boy, they start upselling like crazy. And we always told them to tell your table, you know, before you leave, maybe you'd like one of these iced coffees to go. So that was a really big, important part of how we upsold all the time. So the, the reason I added coffee to that is because that made the difference. Remember I talked about a sensory reaction and a wow coffee experience? Um, that was really important. So we want you to know that we at Segafredo that we understand that adding a coffee program to your restaurant's menu will change things for you. It also means that we can supply this brand, we can supply the partnership that you need that will add value to your menu, and we understand your day part. And becoming a trusted premium partner, you can count on us to deliver that coffee program that enhances and elevates your menu and reputation. When the customers experience the high quality branded coffee, you are set apart from the other restaurants in town. So we understand your day. I started out by saying I understand your pain, I understand your struggles, and we wanna make it easier for you. How do we make it easier for you? We bring in more customers, we have a higher check average, we help you with all of this, and then you have something that you don't have to think about, and boy, isn't that just the best? And I want to end with this. There's never been a sadness that can't be cured by a breakfast food and even coffee. Thank you so much for listening today. 
All right, Ina, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. There was some really good insight into building the breakfast business there. Um, as Ina said, we are going to turn to our audience Q&A now. Uh, so if you've not uh, submitted your questions yet, please do go ahead and get those in, and we'll answer as many as we can in, in the next few minutes. Um, we do have several lined up already, uh, so I'll get started with those. Uh, and I would uh, invite both um, Ina and Jill to, to chime in on these questions. Uh, first up, uh, my wait staff has trouble upselling coffee beverages such as cold brew lattes, et cetera. Um, I like your idea, Ina, of an extra person going to the tables to just focus on beverage upselling. Are there any other ideas you have to upsell my coffee beverages? Jill, do you want to start with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think from our perspective, a few things that we've seen work really well uh, out in at our customers um, has been offering free samples to really drive um, some trial of um, menu offerings that may be a little bit more unfamiliar to consumers, uh, like cold brew or nitro cold brew, um, really helps get customers comfortable with, with a product before ordering a full glass of, of that item. Um, mm-hmm. Other things that we've, we've tried out have been around um, you know, training wait staff to really speak eloquently about the products as well. Uh, like you mentioned, Ina, right? Your, um, your staff understanding that the, the juice is fresh squeezed and that, you know, all the really great attributes of the product, very important mm-hmm. to also um, train wait staff to, to make sure that they understand, um, you know, all the nuances of, of selling an item to a, to a customer. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to say something about serving uh, samples, you know, in the waiting area. There's always an issue about that because if you give them a big cup, um, they sometimes don't order coffee when they sit down at the table. Um, and there's no way that you can charge them then for that big cup that you offered them for nothing. Um, and so we used, when we when we did this, and we have done it in, in two of my restaurants, um, we only use very small cups. And so if they brought it to table, at least the server would know that this was not standard and that they would offer them coffee and put it in our mugs. The other thing that we did once in a while, and it did work, it just depended on, it had to be good weather because people were going to be walking around. We um, we offered a special to-go of the day. Um, and these were people who had already had breakfast, but people don't eat dessert usually with breakfast. So we said to them, would you like a coffee to go, an iced coffee to go with a muffin or a scone? And we had a special pricing on that. So they were able to walk out the door with a little bag that had an ice drink for later and a coffee or a muffin or a scone for later as well. And that definitely was an upsell and it definitely made them happier. You got another question, Greg? Yes, we do. Um, Okay, an attendee says, I'm interested in coffee and breakfast pairings. Where is the best place to start? Um, Jill, I'm going to take that one. Um, The chef's palate, the manager's palate, is the best place to start. You know, most of us would grab a cup of coffee at our restaurant, and by the time you get to drink it, you know, it's so cold that you don't even finish it. The key is to sit down and to have a cup of coffee just like your customers do and to decide um, if that matches up to the most flavorful dish on your menu. Order one of those dishes, sit down at a table, and then have your coffee with that, and you tell me if it's good enough for that dish. And the chances are it's probably not as good as it should be. Um, And you need to have samples um, brought to you to brew so that you, you get a chance to see the difference. So the Segafredo Zanetti rep would, would say, listen, I'm going to give you a mild to an intense, and let's brew some of this up, and let's see what matches your food. That is the only way to determine it. You can't just buy um, a blend and expect it to be the right one unless you have tasted it yourself in optimal conditions, which most of us never got a chance to do. Yep, I'll chime in here as well, Ina, and and echo what you said about making sure that you're trying multiple blends. Uh, It's very important that when you are initially tasting coffees to make sure that you're you're finding the right fit for your for your operation. Um, So going Mm -hmm. through uh, a tasting from light to medium to dark roast and also just different blends of coffees uh, create different experiences when you're drinking them with different dishes. So going through that right. entire process um, is really important. Right. And like Ina said, um, from a Segafredo perspective, 
um, we absolutely are willing to, to come into your operation and, and work through the process with you, alongside you. Right. All right. Sure. The next, next question that we have, uh, is there a benefit to calling out my coffee brand on the menu? The answer is I'll yes. I'll that. <laughs> the answer is Good answer, Ida. Yes. That's it's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, Pete, you, you want to show people that you're proud of what you've chosen. You know, that becomes part of your branding as well. Their branding is your branding. Oh, they think enough of me to use this coffee. This is a good thing. And so, yes, call it out. Talk about it. Yes, absolutely. We see or we hear from, from customers, um, you know, the, um, the power that calling out a brand on their menu, um, you know, the validity, validity that that gives them with their customers um, in sort of signaling um, that they've selected a quality product, that they have a quality program. Uh, so mm -hmm. you know, definitely something that um, that we hear um, ourselves is is definitely something helpful to have on the menu. Mm -hmm. All right, one more question we have. Uh, I don't know much about coffee, so how do I go about implementing a qu high quality ho coffee program? Oh, I got the answer to that. Um, the Sega Fredo Zanetti rep, first of all, is your consultant. You know, you can pay a lot of money to bring a consultant in to talk to you about this and teach you, but here you have somebody who is coming in the door who really wants to be your consultant in this. Um, the other thing that people in, in our position, and I say that in terms of being an operator, is we know, we feel like it's going to be too hard to change the program. We're so busy worrying about is the freezer at temp, you know, who didn't show up for work today, is everything going well. And so we think about, oh, my God, one more thing. I'm supposed to change my coffee program. I cannot tell you how easy it is when you have somebody on your side. Um, it's not as intensive as you think, and your Segafredo Zanetti partner will guide you through the entire process and make it so easy for you that you won't even realize it sort of happened. He's, he and she are your consultants in this. And so don't worry. You won't have a hard time. You will have a delicious time. All right. Uh, it looks like that is all the time that we have today. So we'll go ahead and, and conclude the program. Uh, many thanks to Segafredo Zanetti for making this program possible. Um, to our audience for attending, and of course to Ina Pinkney for sharing her considerable insight. Uh, several of you did ask uh, if the program was uh, recorded. It was, and in fact, we will send you an email letting you know when that recording is available. Thanks again, and have a great day. Thank you.